where Jesus comes walking to them again on the Sea of Galilee. And it says he walks as though he's going by them. And so then they, they call to him. And that's the one where he has Peter get out of the boat and walk towards him and he sinks. Remember that one? The thing that I find interesting here is that as they get to the village, they presume Jesus is going on and that Jesus is not going to stay with them. And in the boat, they presume he's going to pass them and he's not coming to them in the boat. And one of the things to understand about Jesus, what Jesus is always about is us. We, I don't know if, if you're this way, but like for instance, um, I had some friends come to San Luis Obispo uh, a couple weeks ago, and I have a fra favorite restaurant in San Luis that's open sometimes, and sometimes it isn't. I don't keep close enough watch on that. I don't go that often to actually know. So I said a little prayer in my heart that it would be open, and, and it was. But I was thinking about it later. I was thinking, I'm sitting in San Luis Obispo, praying that this particular restaurant will be open, thinking in my mind, in the world, there's probably 100 million people who are praying they will get anything to eat today. There are people who are immensely holy that are turning to God in their prayers. You just get the impression on a list of priorities, a prayer about the best restaurant might not hit very high on God's to-do list, you know? I, I can imagine there are a lot of people who should get attention before me, and certainly any petition should get attention before that, you know? But the fact of the matter is, because God is infinite, God deals with each one of us, and though we are the only person who has ever lived. And that's also something to remember about salvation. Jesus didn't die for the salvation of everybody. Jesus died for your salvation. Always think of it as an individual thing. Jesus died for me. And because he's an infinite God, every person on the face of the earth can say that. And if you were the only person who had ever existed, he would have died on the cross for you. He would do it for any single person. And that's what it means to be an infinite God. So they think he's going on, and they urge him, stay with us, for it's nearly evening and the day is over. So he went in to stay with them. Uh, a couple things to notice about this. Um, the fact that um, they mentioned at the beginning uh, the, the name of one of them, but not the other. I think they mentioned was Clophus was the name. And they don't mention the other. And the fact that two of them are living together and Jesus goes into their home, I think you can presume they are a man and a woman. You can presume they're a couple that are walking. Okay? And um, so Jesus goes in. in. In that time, you would not travel between cities without a group of people. It just wasn't safe to do that. So in, in the evening, almost all groups stopped at whatever place they were at and stayed. Incidentally, what we would call a motel today, at that time was simply a walled area, maybe, um, maybe uh, the size of this room, incidentally, a square with a wall, and you would come in and different people would camp against the wall at different places, and there was a big fire in the center if you wanted to cook your food or stuff like that, and there was water there. But that's basically, you know, the Hyatt Regency of the day. So that's, that's kind of the way it was. <laughs> and, uh, and as it got dark, you would always go into one of these places. You wouldn't go on. Remember, there are a couple things that are extinct today. The major one being the Holy Land Lion, there was a lion in the Holy Land. It's extinct today. It's called the Holy Land Lion. It looked like the African lion. It had a slightly smaller mane, but that's about the only difference. And if you read in the scriptures, you'll find stories about David or Samson that had to fight lions in order to protect their sheep. Okay? So the, it wasn't really smart or safe to walk at night. So they say the day's over. So Jesus goes in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. Okay? With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. So as soon as Jesus does this, they recognize him. Now, does that mean they recognize him facially? They recognized him by the blessing. You'll notice that the same thing will happen later on 
when Jesus is cooking breakfast on a, a beach, that they will somehow recognize him in the blessing. Uh, I'm presuming that Jesus had kind of a standard way of blessing, and then their eyes are cleared as to who it is. Because remember, they are not prepared for resurrection, so that they, they, don't, they don't see it as Jesus. And as soon as they recognize him, then Jesus disappears. And the idea here is the only reason Jesus is here is for them to recognize him. So that once they recognize him, then he's gone. He's, he's done what he's supposed to do. And I think one of the things to watch in the action of God is that God is always about something. You know, God isn't just wandering around. God's always about something. And God will work for that accomplishment. Uh, one of the things that I think is very interesting in the lives of the saints, you'd notice this if you read much of the autobiographical material of Mother Teresa. Uh, many people are reading the autobiographical material of Mother Teresa think that she should have left the faith because she felt abandoned by God and she didn't feel the presence of God and this sort of stuff in her later years. And see, at that point, she did not feel the presence of God because God had done what he wanted with her. He had made her a saint. So then, you know, he became more evident in other people's lives. God is least evident in the life of the holiest person. And that's because as, as we grow, what he's about doing, now he's doing in other people's lives, okay? And so that's something you must come to peace with. And one of the great saints of the church, the great mystics, um, uh, John of the Cross, uh, he called it the dark night of the soul. And he says, it, it's just one of the things you gotta get used to. There are a lot of strange things about God. And if you deal with God, you gotta get used to them, okay? So he vanished. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? This is a very, very important verse. Do you notice that in their encounter with Jesus, they don't mention a single thing he said. They probably don't remember. What do they remember? They remember how they were interiorly transformed. How many of you have ever heard the word mystagogia? Yeah. They use the word mystagogia to describe the training that they give people after baptism to understand what took place in baptism. You see, it's supposed to be a completely transforming thing. And I don't know if you, you've ever had the experience. Um, I would say probably my best experience of this was a man by the name of Marshall McLuhan Marshall McLuhan was a futurist, and he looked to the future. Now, I have to remember, I'm talking about a guy who spoke in the early 60s. And one of the things that um, we had to do in our university was when you quoted someone in a thesis, you had to quote them in the language in which they wrote. So like if I was quoting Thomas Aquinas, I had to quote him in Latin. I couldn't quote him in English, okay? And so in the library that we had, we had lots of works in French. I went to school in French Canada. So we had lots of books in French, lots of books in English, okay? And because it's a Catholic school, we had lots of books in Latin, okay? But suppose you get a guy who wrote like Schellebeck. Schellebeck wrote in Dutch. Well, I could get a, a French translation or an English translation but I couldn't get a Dutch copy of his book in my university. And so I couldn't use him, even though I'd see a good quote in his book. So we were complaining about this, and Marshall McLuhan, who was our professor at the time, said, in your lifetime, remember the 1960s, he said, you will be able to access every library in the world from your own room. Now remember, there's no internet. There's not even a computer at this time. Okay? And he said, you'll be able to do that. Well, another time we were talking to him and he said, in your own lifetime, one day you'll be able to talk to any person anywhere on the face of the earth instantly. Now you have to know at this time there was no such thing as a phone that didn't have a cord. None at all. Okay? The fact of the matter is this man had a view of the future that was unbelievable, and he was right about everything. I wish I'd bought stock. But anyway, he was right about everything. And the thing that is most interesting 
when you would listen to him, he was looking at a world you couldn't see. It's like you were blind and he was describing a sunset. It was a beautiful description of everything, but you really couldn't see it. That's mystagogia. I was transformed listening to the man, but I never knew a single thing he said. It all went over my head because he was just dealing with this. That's the way it is with Jesus. If you listen to Jesus carefully, it's always difficult to understand, but you will be changed. You will be changed. And you know, that's what we're about. We're not about educating this world. We're about changing it. We want to bring about change, which is exactly what Jesus did. And that's called mystagogia. So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the 11 and those with them who were saying, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Do you know we have no other mention in the scriptures of where Jesus appeared to Simon Peter. But we know from this verse, he appeared to Simon Peter after Magdalene, but before these two men returned to Jerusalem. Sometime in there, Jesus appeared to Simon Peter, okay? Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Interestingly, remember the text we saw earlier about this, these people, arrived back to Jerusalem and told the people what had happened to them on the way, but were gone before they heard Magdalene say that she had seen him. Okay? So they're gone in that thing, and, and they leave. And uh, they, they explain to them how he's made known in the breaking of the bread. This particular story was one of the most important to the early church. And one of the reasons why it's important to the early church is that you and I will only know Jesus in the breaking of the bread. And if I do not see Jesus in the breaking of the bread, I will not see him on the face of the earth because Jesus is not there to be seen physically. Jesus is not there to be seen in other ways, but he is here to be seen in the breaking of the bread, okay? And if you've never heard this before, just to tell you that when you celebrate the liturgy, uh, the reason the priest has a larger host is so that it can be broken. It's very important to the liturgy that the host is broken. So if for some reason they never put out a big one, the priest will break one of the little ones. It's important that the bread is broken. And in the early church, the cer ceremony that you and I call the Eucharist, they all called the breaking of the bread. That was the name of the ceremony, okay? So, we go on to another appearance. While they were still speaking about this, Jesus stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you, okay? And so he's explaining this. Now remember, we're still on Easter Sunday. We're still on the Sunday of Easter. And so he appears to them and says, peace be with you. It says, but they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost, okay? Remember this, uh, did I mention about the ghost business earlier? That they believed that every person had a duplicate and it was a duplicate ghost. And so, um, I don't know if you've ever happened when you see someone who looks exactly like someone you know and um, you go up and they aren't. And uh, anyway, that the way the Jews explained that was that everyone had a duplicate and the, the duplicates walked around. But they said there were two things about ghosts. Number one, you couldn't touch a ghost. So if you went to a ghost, you'd go right through it. And that's why when Jesus appears to them, he will almost always have them touch him so that they know it's not the ghost. And remember when he was walking on the water, they thought it was a ghost. And it wasn't, it was Jesus. And the second thing a ghost can't eat. If a ghost puts anything in its mouth, it just falls through it. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But anyway, the, the idea is the ghost cannot eat. And so oftentimes you'll see when Jesus appears to them, he will eat, okay? So they were terrified and thought they were seeing the ghost. They're convinced it isn't Jesus. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do questions arise in your heart? Now, the, these, are, um, these are really interesting questions. Why are you troubled? And why do questions arise? Even I can tell you that. 
They're troubled and questions arise because no one has ever risen from the dead. It's just that simple, okay? It's no one has ever risen from the dead. So this is why their questions arise. He says, look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. And so he says, notice my hands and feet. Someone asked me earlier about why he mentions hands. Understand that if you were to study Hebrew, you would discover that studying Hebrew, if you were to get a full Hebrew dictionary, it's gonna look something like a pamphlet. Hebrew is a very small language. They don't have a big vocabulary. So the word hand can mean anything on the arm. It's not a shoulder. They have a word for shoulder, but their word for arm is, is loosely. If you had the elbow, they'd call it the arm, okay? So they don't go by very technical terms. We know the, the uh, what do you call it? The nail was always put through the wrist, okay? Because that's, if it were put in the hand, it would pull off. You, you wouldn't hold a body up that way. So um, he says, I look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones like I have. So he says, you need to come forward, you need to touch me. As he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they were still incredulous for joy and were amazed, he asked them, okay? You notice incredulous? It means they still couldn't believe. They were still incredulous for joy. It was too good to believe, okay? Too good to believe. He says, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of baked fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. Incidentally, if I arise from the dead and appear to you, I don't want baked fish, I want lobster, okay? <laughs> For God's sake, after the resurrection, you get baked fish. Anyway, one of the things I'd like you to notice is this room. This room in which Jesus appears to them is the room in which the Last Supper took place, and it is the model of the church itself. And what takes place in this room? What takes place in this room is people go out of this room to do things. Peter goes to the tomb. Magdalene goes to the tomb. These people go to Emmaus. We see these people coming and going from the room. But what happens in the room? In the room, everyone shares their personal experience of Jesus. So that Magdalene comes back and says, I saw Jesus. Peter and John come back and say, we saw the way the robes were arranged. And then Peter says, now I've seen Jesus. These people from Emmaus come back and say, we've seen Jesus. The fact of the matter is, no one person's experience of Jesus is enough to confirm faith. But everyone's experience of Jesus is enough to confirm everyone's faith. And if people do not share their experience of Jesus, they will never know he's risen from the dead. They will believe it, but they won't know it. And to the degree you and I are able to share our personal experience of Jesus, we begin to support for everyone's understanding. You see, the specific thing that might happen to me, I might say that I was going in for a cancer surgery and I prayed to God that he would take care of me, and the cancer surgery came absolutely perfect. Well, there's a thousand ways to explain that. A good doctor, a lucky break, I give you a thousand explanations. But I feel it was Jesus, because I prayed as I was going in. Do you realize that if I speak to 50 other people who all prayed before they went in their operations and they were all successful, I'll begin to realize it was Jesus. That's exactly what happened. And he may have worked through the doctor, the nurse, whoever, but he did it. We have to be a community that shares these stories. And for some reason, Catholics are not very good at that. Pentecostals seem much better at that than we are. But we need to share the stories because it is the stories, the, in, the collective stories of the community that make faith so strong. Do you know that most of us here, I would say at one time or another, study saints and read books about saints and stuff. And one of the reasons why that feels so good to you to do things like that is because that is the collective memory of the church. That, so that you know 
how God acted in Festina's life. You know how God acted in Lewis's life. You know how God acted in Gatiri's life. You know how God acted in any of the saints you want to study. You find out how God, but it confirms that God is acting in my life. And it's very important to daily living to know that God is acting in your life. Okay? Now we're going to switch over to John's gospel. We're in chapter 20, verse 19. Thomas, called Didymus, incidentally the word Didymus means twin. Thomas was a twin. Uh, we don't know whether his brother or sister uh, was around the apostolic community at all. But anyway, Thomas was a twin. Okay? One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. Remember I told you people are going in and out of this room. So Thomas is gone. No, he might have gone to Starbucks for coffee or something. But anyway, he's gone. Okay? The other disciples said to him, we have seen the Lord. He said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the nail marks and my hand into his side, I will not believe. Okay? So Thomas says that he will not believe unless he actually touches the wounds of Jesus Christ. Now this sounds really harsh to us, but remember in the last thing we just read, all the other apostles touched him. Remember, he had them all come forward and touch him. Thomas is asking for nothing more than his right as an apostle, and no one should call him the doubting Thomas. He is asking for exactly what the others have already experienced. It's his right as an apostle, okay? So now a week later, the disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. This is the first Sunday after Easter now, a week later. Jesus came, although the doors were locked and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Every time Jesus arrives, he says, peace be with you. Part of the ability to interrelate with God is peace. And a person needs to be able to find peace in their lives. Your ability to pray is tied to peace. Your ability to listen to God. And you know that um, I, I come from a family that's cursed with very long life. People live till very old age. My father tells me it's because the good die young. But anyway, in my family, we all live to very old ages, okay? And one of the things that has been most important to me in my life, and I've been very successful at it, is preserving peace. I, I, like, for instance, at one time my house was robbed, and a lot of things that were very significant to me uh, were taken. Uh, all the things that I had received uh, from my grandparents, my parents were gone. They were all taken. And... Uh, so it was very important to me, but it was also important to me to preserve peace. So I told myself in my mind, when I get to heaven, the first weekend I have free, I'm going to hell and find that person. Okay? <laughs> I'm getting those things back, okay? But I'll leave it till then, okay? So it won't bother me. Another example is that I gave up my driver's license the day I turned 70. I turned it in automatically because my experience is older men, the thing they resent most is when their license is taken away. My dad's license was taken away 20 years ago. He's still bitter about it. Still bitter about it, you know? So I decided no one's taking my license. I'm getting rid of it because I will not give up peace. Another thing I've found is that as you get older, some people's memories began to fail. Not, not mine, of course, but um, many people. I, sh I should tell you something my grandmother told me. My grandmother told me it's all part of life. She says, your hearing begins to go because you won't remember what was said anyway when you get older, okay? Then she, then she says, your sight begins to go, but you're not that good looking anymore either. <laughs> that it's all part of the great plan of God, okay? But anyway, you, you really want to preserve peace. But this thing about memory, I've noticed that older people always think people are stealing from them. 
and they think people are stealing from them because they forget where they put things, you know? And, and after you've accused people of stealing from you, you find out where they moved it, you know? So, but, but I think, you know, you need to educate yourself because it's very important to me. I have a very powerful prayer life and I have it because I've preserved peace and nothing in my life is more important than peace. If I preserve peace, I will remain in this dialogic relationship with God. And that to me, I don't care if I die broke and naked, I want to be in this relationship to God, that's all, okay? So anyway, when Jesus comes, he says, peace be with you. The idea is peace is the background for Jesus relating to them. So we need to have this peace. So he says, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Bring your hand, put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Okay? And you notice Jesus isn't angry, isn't upset, isn't, why don't you believe? Not that at all. Jesus says, what's required for your faith? Well, what's required for my faith is I stick my finger in your hand. <laughs> Come on up here and do it, brother. You know? One of the things to, to be aware of in the people we deal with in society, different things are demanded for some people's faith. You know, that, that some people have a powerful, powerful faith very easily. And if that happens to you, you should thank God. But don't be judgmental of people who have trouble coming to faith. But understand that every person's salvation is important to God. So whatever is the door to their faith, God will make sure that door is there. And it may be something, you know, finger in the hand, whatever. But whatever this person requires for faith, God will make available to them, and frequently. One of my experiences of God is he does not take no for an answer. So if you say no to God, for God it means come back later. Once we say yes, he's got you. But no, he never accepts. He does not accept no. So in people's lives, just know that God will keep working and all this sort of thing. And there are all different requirements for faith. People have all different requirements. And so don't, you know, just, just wait for it. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Very interesting. We see Thomas as almost, you know, the hardest one to convince. But having been convinced, he makes the highest statement of faith. Amen. Lord and God. Okay? Jesus said to him, have you come to believe because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. That's a beatitude pronounced on us. Now I want you to notice, notice a lot of this post-resurrection material is actually written for us, not for them. When they talk about the breaking of the bread, they saw Jesus, but they needed to know the breaking of the bread was important because the bread would be what we'd have, not Jesus, okay? Here, he gets to actually touch Jesus. But touching Jesus isn't important because we won't have that. What is important is the faith he comes to by touching. And so we're, we're called to that faith. Incidentally, this is the place where John's gospel originally ended. But we'll go on. So here's the, the next verse. Now Jesus did many other things in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through this belief, you may have life in his name. So he says there's a lot of things that occurred in the life of Jesus that have not been written down. And that's one of the reasons why we have four gospel accounts. Each one of them, and you notice how I'm switching around? Each one of them seems to record kind of things that appeal to them. Um, if, I don't know if you've ever been involved in a really significant event. 